welcome everybody. It's great to be here with uh, all of you. This is, uh, is this our, oh, this is our second in-person uh, talk. Uh, and we're very excited to have Vernell here, Vernell Knoll. Uh, Vernell was a student here back in, I want to say, 2013, yes, 2013. Um, wait, you graduated in 2013? Yeah, she graduated, she came in in 2011. I think at that time, the department was really different. I would say it was, um, I would say it was we were really sort of in the middle of getting our group together and getting our students together, especially our PhD program. Even though it had been going on for a long time, I think it really had gained a lot of speed around the time that uh, Vernell had come in. So it's great to actually see her back. But I'll do a quick little brief introduction, but I'll try to um, do a, talk about as much about her that I know uh, as possible. So uh, Vernell is director of the Situated Computing and Design Lab at Georgia Tech. Uh, I know the main thing that I really know about Vernell is that she's a graduate of Howard University. And when she came here from Howard University, we had a number of contacts that we had in common. Um, when Vernell was here, she worked a lot on uh, computation and carnival together doing a shape grammar uh, her thesis on shape grammars as it relates to the uh, to the carnival experience, and uh, her new work right now is more about the intersection of uh, computation and the way it relates more to uh, craft and how it can assist craftspeople in doing their work. And one of the things that I had seen online was uh, a project that she's recently done that I know she's not going to talk about too much today, but is actually really quite interesting. And it deals with the intersection of AI, craft, and computation, and how uh, designers can make really creative and interesting things, but as they relate more to Carnival and the expressive nature of Carnival. And I have to say, I've never been to Carnival, but I have a lot of Trinity friends, and I hope to get to go someday. So with anyway, I'll keep it short. So this is Rennell. Rennell, no, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, MIT Architecture. So happy to be here. All right, happy to see all the familiar faces. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, thank you very much. I look forward to sharing uh, my thoughts with you today. Um, I titled my talk, Situated Computations, Craft and Technology. <clears throat> like Larry mentioned, I'm director of the Situated Computation and Design Lab at Georgia Tech. And in my work, I research into making, for making, through making, with making. Terry is all about making, so she knows what I mean. Um, so I examine traditional and automated practices, cultures, digital and automated practices, et cetera, and their intersections with society. I examine knowledges and practices, tools and technologies, or communities and cultures around both digital and traditional making practices to explore uh, and build new computational tools, methodologies, practices, expressions, um, and explore new reconfigurations for computational design practice pedagogy and publics. So the question for today, I think, for this talk, um, based on what, uh, how Larry introduced me, I would say would be around craft and computation. How might craft and cultural practices reshape computational practices, ideas and labors, and vice versa? Some of the problems that I address in my work include the disappearance or erasure of craft or cultural skills, knowledges, practices, and communities. Their omission from uh, discourses in computational design and us understanding the effects of craft and computation alongside human welfare. The vision for the work is to repair both, repair craft practices and computational design practices. And why do this to undo damages that might have occurred in the past and today, and they could be social, technical, theoretical, cultural. 
Um, two, to improve current and future technologies and processes that we develop and design as computational designers. And to consider the small repairs that we might make and their larger social implications. When I talk about repair, I refer to Senate's description of repair as a point of departure, comprising restoration, remediation, and reconfiguration. Restoration being a recovery in which the damage and use of history is undone with the restorer as a servant of the past. Remediation as preserving an existing form while substituting old parts for new and improved ones or new and improved ways of doing things. And reconfiguration, which is a more radical kind of repair, exploring these connections between small repairs and larger consequences. And they go about doing this through an approach I call situated computations or a framework. And what situation computation does or is, it's an approach to computational design to research, practice, pedagogy that grounds our tools or methods and theories in the social world by acknowledging the historical, cultural, and material contexts of our field of designing and making. It responds to a setting's social and technological infrastructures, and it asks that we refuse to remain ignorant of social and political structures that shape them. Some of the things it accomplishes are that it creates space for participation by those who are missing, missing in practices. Uh, it resists the segregating and privileging of certain types of intelligences and skills, and it seeks to amplify the stories of historically excluded or marginalized groups. Currently, there are eight principles for this framework. I'll share a little bit with you today on how I operationalize this in my work uh, in craft and cultural practices and the vice versa such that we reveal histories, human dimensions, and recognize the partiality of all our knowledges within specific contexts. And I'll begin here. I'll begin at the cultural practice of the Trinidad Carnival, and I'll first start by sharing with you a bit of the history and practices involved in Carnival. This is the fun part, OK? Uh, so French planters introduced carnival to Trinidad in the 1780s. And although Africans engaged in carnival festivities during their enslavement, after slavery was abolished in 1834, they reinvented the carnival to express their creativity, freedom, aesthetic sensibilities, and to reclaim their humanity in the face of a system that considered them less than human. While Europeans participated in carnival for fun and frolic, for Africans, for those of African descent, carnival was a religion, a form of psychological release of tensions from domination, segregation, and violent, inhumane systems of control. This is an engraving from 1888 of carnival celebrations in the capital city of Port of Spain. The term Trinidad Carnival or Trinidad and Tobago Carnival doesn't define its geographic location, but its origin. I have seen Carnival right here on Massaf, right? You all seen Carnival. Um, but instead, it defines the three main elements that define Carnival, that being mass or the masquerade, calypso, soca music, and the steel pan. Uh, calypso and soca being the music native to Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, the steel pan or steel drum, which was, was invented in the 1930s in Trinidad and Tobago from old, old, old discarded oil drums. There are more than 70 carnivals around the globe. Like I mentioned, I've experienced it even here in Cambridge. Um, these are some images of Blue Devil characters in Juve in Carnival. This is one aspect of Carnival. And it originates from the celebration of resistance and emancipation from enslavement, from these dangerous, uh, forced, uh, cruel um, labor of enslavement. So these are Blue Devils. They blow fire and dance and make music from biscuit tins. Um, this is uh, the, the actual masquerade. So in addition to celebrating resistance and emancipation, it's also a space of joy, 
of creativity, of innovation. This is a photo from 1957. This uh, is a band by George Bailey. Um, and I think of the carnival, of our carnival, as the internet of that time. Public education in art, in history, in society, all of this is wrapped up in carnival. People portrayed and educated publics on their histories, real histories, imagined histories, past and future. Um, integral aspects of, of carnival are also about community. The root of carnival is about doing things together, making together, expressing creativity together, singing together, dancing together, celebrating together. And at mass camps, which are places where people come together to make, design um, costumes for carnival, there are these interactions and feelings of family closeness, feelings of bonding, friendships that are created while designing, cooking, listening to music, making together, all of this happening in shared spaces and in competitive spaces also. There's also mentoring and cooperation with people feeling wanted and secure in these spaces, learning how to socialize, how to create, how to respect each other, respect the arts and respect artists. Engaging in design and making in carnival is of itself a form of community engagement. However, most if not all of the wire benders and designers I met during my research, they organized community events, mothers and fathers, the events, for example, football competitions to keep communities together. So these are some of the elements intertwined within the histories and practices of the making culture in Trinidad Carnival but it's also about design and making. Um, people create and perform costumes depicting history, imaginations, social topics, environmental topics. Um, on the left is an image from the 1950s of costuming, on the right, costuming from 2016. It's also about innovation, just like the steel pan. Uh, this is an image of Peter Minshall's band from 1984. And in this project, he took an active bending approach to dancing sculptures or costuming um, by inserting fiberglass rods into fabric, creating textile hybrid costuming. In addition to costuming, we have these large structures that are decorated and performed in carnival. We call them kings and queens of carnival, um, but I refer to them or define them as dancing sculptures. And within the carnival, one of the craft practices integral to the design and fabrication of costuming and dancing sculptures is the craft of wire bending. Wire bending is a craft that combines elements of engineering, architecture, and sculpture to create structures, two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures. It began in the 1930s in Carnival, and in it, wire, fiberglass rods, and other linear materials are bent and shaped to create these structures, like you see here. Um, and these artifacts, or these architectures, are expressions of creativity, innovation, and technical skill. This is a photo of Stephen Derrick, an expert wirebender who I learned from, who unfortunately has since passed away. This is a photo from 1969 of a group of wirebenders. Historically, this practice is a male-dominated practice. So it started here um, in 2012, 2013, where my interrogation into design and carnival began because I was noticing a changing aesthetic in the carnival and had hunches as to why that was occurring. Um, scholars gave social, cultural, and economic perspectives on these aesthetic changes, but my hypothesis was that there were problems occurring in design. Um, that's when I found the craft of wire bending and that it was disappearing and its potential disappearance signals a loss of all that I've shown you before. Cultural history, heritage, community engagement, mentoring, all of this is tied to this practice, to people's creativity and their innovation. So based on my research, some of the issues occurring in craft and in wire bending today include that there's little to no documentation of these knowledges, as many times it's tacit, 
unwritten and taught via lengthy apprenticeships to slow transmission of this knowledge, dying practitioners, um, and the change in practices occurring in society and globally. And this is important because craft and these practices are embedded in historical, social, and political frames. Its disappearance signals the erasure of histories of celebration and more. Two, because this knowledge is tied to its practitioners, when they pass away, they take that knowledge with them, making it even more challenging to pass on that culture and that knowledge. And three, studies have shown that the quality of one's craftsmanship is closely tied to the, st the strength of their ties to a community. So strong craftsmanship skills, strong ties to a community, weak craftsmanship skills, weak ties to a community. And we want strong community ties. And these practices are a voice, they're a language, um, ways of world making. And so we don't want these to disappear or go away. And when we forget or leave out these relevant complex histories and voices, things like this can happen where in 2016, a mass designer proposed one section for carnival uh, and there was a public outcry about it. And he was accused of trivializing the trauma of slavery, which I've shown you before is connected to that uh, reframing of carnival, that reinvention of carnival. And he and his work were seen by some as glamorizing, a part of colonial history where racism, socioeconomic disparity were rampant and continues today. Uh, on the right is a meme created by someone um, highlighting their feelings about that production that seemingly valorizes a sort of slave narrative and a nostalgia for an era that abused, oppressed, and disenfranchised African people. So to summarize, these are some of the issues involved in the craft of wire bending and the practice of Trinidad Carnival. Dying practices, fragmenting of communities, disappearance of knowledges, missing demographics, and producing work that might trivialize people's histories and their cultures. So question, how might computation, software-based practices in design reshape the ideas, practices, and labors in the Trinidad Carnival. And my work started here um, with the Bailey Derrick Grammar, um, where while I was doing my graduate studies here at MIT, um, my first step was to develop a computational tool, a shape grammar, to address this problem of documentation and transmission of wire bending knowledge. Documentation included examining wirebenders participating in the craft to make that tacit embodied knowledge in wirebending explicit. On the left is Stephen Derrick. On the right might start at describing this craft using symbols, operations, and rules. So named after Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick, the grammar computationally describes technical knowledge in wirebending. It's a series of drawings that describes the material, steps, and techniques in wire bending, allowing analysis, transmission for expertise, for education, research, and practice. This is Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick. Uh, the grammar externalizes and formalizes tacit rules so that they are less tied to practitioners, which is important when, if and when they are dying or retiring from the practice. It facilitates documentation and recording of the design and making process and sheds light on the craft's computational dimensions, opening it up for expansion and inquiry. This is an example of how the grammar facilitates documentation of design and fabrication in the, in the craft. So after developing this tool, my hypothesis was that it could address this problem that I mentioned of transmitting knowledge. So I conducted a series of workshops in Trinidad and in the US to evaluate the grammar, what might happen in pedagogical settings, etc. So I went, um, did these workshops, participants here included uh, students and teachers, and they were tasked with designing and building artifacts using wire bending techniques, tools, and materials to get a sense of what they knew or what they didn't know. They then had to communicate how and what they made 
to another team without talking, and this comes from uh, our class with Terry, um, Ready, all right? One of my favorite uh, methods or exercises in class, actually, um, where they had to communicate how they made these artifacts without speaking to each other. No notes, just drawings, or, or notes. No, they didn't see each other's artifact. Uh, in the second part of the workshop, I taught them the grammar, sort of the technical knowledge behind the craft, how to use it, how to use it to ask questions and speculate, to explore. I taught them about the materials, the connections, why and how they are used, the theory behind the practice, if you would have called it that. Then demonstrated practical skills, how to make bends, how to wrap tape, how to rotate their wrists, how to move their bodies in engaging in this practice. Then they would design and build their artifacts using the grammar and instruct another team on how to make it. So before learning the grammar, these are images of before and after. Before learning it, there was poor craftsmanship, conflicting standards and instructions, a lack of knowledge, uh, missing information, and a general lack of confidence expressed by participants. After learning the grammar, however, there was improved craftsmanship, there was an agreed standard for communication. It facilitated the replication of artifacts, which they weren't able to do properly before, and it increased their confidence in knowing what to do or, or exploring possibilities for what they might do. Um, in, this, uh, in these photos, artifacts on the left are the originals. Artifacts on the right are replica, replications. So replications are possible with the grammar. Um, one of the coolest things coming out of this workshop, though, was a collaborative approach to the craft, which is new. Currently, the practice is singular with one person to one artifact. The grammar, however, opened it up with many people being able to participate in the design and fabrication of one artifact. It afforded a collaborative approach to wire bending, which currently does not exist, and appealed to participants. This reinforces mentoring, cooperation, and social interaction that's embedded in making in Carnival. It also facilitates additional ways of engaging in the craft, from documentation to analysis to fabrication and assembly. So some of uh, the contributions of this work included the restoration of wire bending knowledge, improving technical knowledge and technical skill, documentation of the process to pass on this knowledge to others, and enabling collaborative approaches to the craft. Um, all right, another question. How might craft-based practices reshape design pedagogy in both craft and computation? Well, I developed three computational approaches to crafting and wire bending that included CNC machines and digital fabrication. They were developed to address a lack of participation in wire bending by computational publics, those who may be interested in computational technologies, and the absence of women, children, and those with physical limitations. The practice is quite labor intensive. Um, and so these, it may be out of reach for some. So how might we use technology to open the practice up? So I evaluate, evaluated these approaches with 11 students, three men, eight women. 10 out of the 11 uh, self-reported little to no experience in wire bending. One reported moderate experience. And the uh, majority female of this class matters because this is different from what I mentioned before. The practice is male dominated. So now I had majority female students, okay? And so this, in this first approach, which I called computational crafting, it employs the Billy Derrick grammar to design and make artifacts in the traditional way that wirebenders would with the aid of the grammar. These are images of some of the artifacts that students made using that approach. In the second approach, which I called crafting fabrication, which preserves the existing form of wire bending, but also substitutes labor intensive bending by hand, that can be labor intensive, right? With computer controlled bending. Um, by by em employing this method, we might open it up to those with physical limitations. These are some of the artifacts made by students. And the third method, uh, which I call digital crafting, employed digital design, uh, 
digital design tools or, uh, and fabrication using speculative software, 3D printing. These are images or designs generated using that speculative tool. And these are artifacts made by some of the students with this approach. So in this work, students could learn craft through computation and the practicing of computation through craft, bringing those interested in craft and computation together, bringing multiple intelligences, visual reasoning, seeing, doing, calculating, and sensory material experiences together in design. The work forecasts a new community that brings together wirebenders and computational designers, accessible by both experts and novices. A third question coming out of this work is how might cultural practices in Carnival reshape computational and architectural practices, ideas, and labors? Well, after teaching my students these approaches and the craft, we would then build a pavilion using these wire bending techniques to further learn about it at the architectural scale and create a piece of architecture. We employed these two methods, the traditional Bailey Derrick uh, and hand tools and the CNC wire bender to broaden the scope of our students' technical skills and reduce the barrier of participation for those with manual limitations. So we started here at the Bailey Derrick Grammar um, and used it as a way to defamiliarize the practice to develop new tectonics and amplify local social relations and roles. Here are a few uh, examples of new tectonics that we designed, we developed, and structurally tested for application at the architectural scale. New tectonics of the language possible because of the Bailey Derrick grammar. In this making-driven approach, physical and digital models facilitated a relationship among visual, corporeal, material, and tactile perceptions, each informing the other. Poetics built on a local skill and re-engaging non-visual experiences in architecture. This is our pavilion. And outcomes from this project included new poetics of construction that highlight local material practices, place, and people. We did pavilions new poetics indicating how different communities beyond those associated with carnival can engage with the history and the future of wire bending. It extends social, corporeal, and sensuous knowledges through human interaction and the forces and flows of materials and craft and architecture. Secondly, it advances the Bailey Derrick grammar with new rules emerging from this uh, experiment and creates new social roles and practices. While bending is much more than the bending and connecting of linear materials to create structures. It's a tectonic language, a structural poetic that is tactile, embodied, and experienced via human perceptions and knowledges that are spatial, corporeal, and kinetic. Conceptually, it inscribes a milieu of interactions between community, senses, and the moving body, while designing and making with static and dynamic linear materials for concurrent expressions of each in three-dimensional space. Uh, th this is a photo of my students and I. And these new communities of wire bending practitioners can continue to can continue invention in the craft and its computational descriptions. This implies that intergenerational and intercultural connections between traditional and contemporary practitioners is possible through computation. Studying tectonics through computational technologies can contribute to our understanding, critique, and counteraction of universalism, along with the placelessness that sometimes happens in architectural computation. Uh, in this second pavilion, we built another pavilion. Um, we designed and built an active bending structure, built again on sort of the culture of carnival and wire bending practices for a lightweight structures exhibition at um, IESS in Barcelona, Spain in 2019. Time flies, I think. Yes, 2019. Uh, these are my students. 
uh, who worked with me on this part of the project. And um, in this project, we wanted to challenge the highly technological approaches to active bending structures. Most active bending projects today employ highly technical, multifaceted computer software uh, for design, simulation, and materialization because these projects are complex, right? Um, studies have employed isogeometric analyses, FEM sim simulations, etc. I remember speaking with Joseph a little bit about uh, some of that simulation too. Um, but while these technologies allow improved prediction and new production systems, they require relatively costly software subscriptions and computational power. Um, also, they require highly technical knowledge and training and advanced manufacturing infrastructures at times. So remember in situated computations, we want to pay attention to existing knowledges. We want to cater to experts and non-experts and consider appropriate computational infrastructure so that those missing could participate. Some related active bending projects that are sensitive to local material practices and skills include uh, the ZCB and Toro Bamboo Pavilions by Christoph Kroller that include local craft techniques and acknowledge the socio-technical and cultural aspects of construction in these settings. So we wanted to broaden the, de the design space of active bending structures and the definition of active bending structures to include those currently missing, those not highly resourced when it comes to technology or expert knowledge. Uh, we wanted to stress social and cultural knowledges of a setting and their relationships to active bending. So using Carnival as our setting, we considered the cultural histories of Carnival, participation in design and making by experts and non-experts, building on existing knowledges in Carnival. Uh, we considered the tools and technologies most used in this setting. And remember, I showed you these costumes from 1984 and mentioned that they were active bending structures. Well, we pulled, our, pulled from this as well as our analysis of our first pavilion um, for further uh, development of what our lightweight structure would be. We, our design comprised of three circles made out of fiberglass rods that we pinched to create the shape that we called a Pringle. So we had this module. Uh, and we selected this design for its modularity, its geometric simplicity, and the coiling possibilities because all of us, all uh, teams or groups who were chosen for the exhibition, we had to carry our pavilions from our countries to Spain. So traveling or transporting our um, exhibitions were an important part of the, of, of the process. This is a scaled model of our design with the larger pavilion behind. And this is construction of our full-scale unit, which was more than 100 feet long, I think, uh, 100 feet in circumference. Uh, my students and they with one Pringle after we made one Pringle. Uh, we exhibited this work at IESS. Um, and the circular geometry allowed us to leverage the flexural properties of the fiberglass rods and link physical form to material properties. This mobility supports the mobile temporary nature of Carnival with quick construction, disassembly, exhibition, and transportation. On the left is our entire pavilion packaged in a drum case for transportation. Here are my students and I. Um, and with this project, we demonstrated that by building on existing knowledges and skills in the culture of craft and design in Carnival, a situated computations approach could broaden the design space, strengthen social and cultural connections, link and advance culture, craft, and computation, and employ tensions and histories in society and materials to drive and generate form. This is a render done by one of my students of that pavilion within the context of Carnival. Um, and this approach, the situated computations approach, can allow the construction and showcasing of active bending structures during Carnival festivities, as shown here. Second, children, adults, craftspersons, many people can participate in the making together using skills and knowledges in the Carnival. 
And it provides an opportunity to integrate knowledges, local knowledges, design practices, and materials as drivers in active bending approaches. So that structure, sociality, material practices, and cultural settings are considered concurrently. So how might cultural practices in carnival reshape computational and architectural ideas by new production systems or pedagogy or tectonics and new conceptions of practices and structures based on cultural knowledge. Now this last project that I will share tonight, it's a new one, it's a recent one launched less than two weeks ago. And it brings together machine learning, heritage, art, architecture, and culture. And it was found, funded by the Mozilla Foundation that had a call around uh, artificial intelligence and its effects on racial justice. So this is our project. Um, and one of the questions that we asked in our project was, how might we educate our publics about artificial intelligence and machine learning through cultural design practices that are familiar to them. Our position was that we wanted to use AI and machine learning for the generation and circulation of cultural heritage and value. And we wanted to showcase how our creativity was tied to our history and our innovations, our expressions in art, design, dance, all of these are vehicles through which we have shared joy, shared absolute joy and knowledge. My collaborators were Valencia James, a dancer, performer, maker, and researcher in dance, theater, and technology, and Dr. Natrice Gaskins, an artist, academic, and author of a new book by MIT Press entitled The Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation. And so the vision for our work was an empowered, creative, Black and Caribbean communities that engage with, learn about, and interrogate artificial intelligence to benefit ourselves and contribute to global discourses on AI through cultural practices of and in Carnival. Um, because we are implicated. Um, we have the example of Cambridge Analytica um, that was used or employed by a party in Trinidad and Tobago and many parts of the world, as we know, um, where they analyzed the social and cultural behaviors of different people in the country according to race and other metrics. Uh, and they were able to manipulate people into voting or not, such that it benefited them in the election. So whether we engage in it or not, we are implicated in big data, in AI, and so through this project, we want to engage with and educate our publics about artificial intelligence, big data, etc. And so our goals were about knowledge. So we conducted two workshops, and this will continue to be part of, of the project, so that we could teach our communities about data, AI, its implications, its politics, and creative applications, about self-efficacy, by increasing our communities' beliefs in their abilities, their agency to use their data creatively, to be critical of how data is collected and used, and to be part of that discourse. And three, to encourage communities to engage with AI in creative practices and education, and to be critical of its applications. So in this part of the project, there are several parts for the project I will share probably three of them today. Um, but we wanted to explore the design possibilities when we build a training set uh, based on dancing sculptures in Carnival to generate new imaginations for dancing sculptures in Carnival as a creative partner, as drivers for possibilities, and to further extend making and design practices in Carnival. So this involved you know, getting data, cleaning data, sorting data, scraping data, um, and uh, using this as a training set to create other fake, fake images of dancing sculptures. Um, two ways that we could have done this, Google Colab with TensorFlow, Runway ML. Um, I started the Google Lab TensorFlow method as a test. Um, in the end, just because of the timeline that we had ended up using runway ML as our method for
for this. So this is, these are just some images of our data set, of what our data set looks like. Um, and these are the fakes that have been generated from that uh, style GAN approach, that GAN network approach to generating new dancing sculptures, new imaginaries of dancing sculptures in Carnival. Okay. And these are possibilities that can reconnect people to their history and connect new ones to not just the past, but to possible futures, imagining possible futures for uh, what we might say with these designs and how we might make them. And this project is more than the generation of design possibilities, but it includes how we showcase, celebrate, and extend carnival and aspects of carnival using digital tools and methods. How do we touch the ground? How do we reach our computational publics? There are several aspects of this project, and so I encourage you to check it out. Um, but I'll share three parts of it, the virtual gallery, virtual juve, and virtual mass. And let me play this, this should play, yeah. Um, so I designed and modeled the architecture for the gallery and using Mozilla Hubs, um, which is a free online space, developed this virtual gallery showcasing these AI generated dancing sculptures. In there there's audio describing the work, describing or talking about carnival, and it also encourages participation by visitors. There is the virtual Juve experience, which showcases AI-generated blue devils, jab-jabs, and jab molasses, again, with audio describing these histories, um, exhibiting videos, having music to sort of curate what Juve might be. So especially over the past two years, many carnivals have been canceled due to the pandemic. So hopefully this brings a sense of uh, nostalgia, uh, filling people back up with the, just the joy of carnival. It's scary and it's beautiful parts. This, okay, this, this plays a little video too. Did I just pause it? Um, again, you could check it out, but these are some of the images and the atmosphere is an attempt to really capture juvie, which happens at night. It's a night mass. These are some of the AI generated blue devils and jab jabs and what these things are, I don't know, but they're scary, they're beautiful and they're imaginative. So it's for each of us to, to decide how we use it, how we might use it. And then there's the virtual mass where persons can get a taste of what it's like being in carnival. So though Larry hasn't gone as yet, he can go here and get a taste for what it's like. Um, listening soca music, watching videos and images on carnival. And the feedback on the work thus far has been very positive with some comments mentioning how meaningful the work is. Uh, someone who is a moko, a moko jambi in carnival, he said that it made his or her day. Um, and then an educator said that this is exactly what I would like to see our country do to highlight our very rich culture. As a player, maker, artist, and educator, I keep driving the point to my fellow art teachers about the carnival arts and preserving the craft for future generations to improve on. Your team has done a great honor to the masters of the golden age and the future mass designers to come. So that's encouraging, so check it out. So how can craft and cultural practices reshape computation? And how can computation reshape craft and culture? by restoring, remediating, and reconfiguring disappearing histories, practices, and voices that can shape research, practice, and education in computation, by informing new conceptions and tectonics of and in architecture, computational tools, and technologies, by engaging with our publics through deep understandings of cultures, societies, histories, and technological possibilities, and by developing new research frameworks, new definitions, new practices, and publics. Taking us back to situated computations, which 
tem attempts to ground our field, our tools, or methods in the social world by acknowledging these things, asking that we refuse to remain ignorant of these social structures. And it creates a space for participation by those missing in craft and computational practices. It resists the segregation and privileging of certain intelligences and skills by building practices that engage multiple ways of seeing, knowing, and doing. And it amplifies the, the stories of historically excluded or marginalized groups by deploying them in practice in education. And education future, future directions for this work includes testing this framework in other craft and design practices and outside, even in outside the design field, and more closely analyzing implications of these principles on processes of technology design. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. So we're going to take a few questions, but uh, maybe I can ask one myself while uh, they're gathering up the mic. So first, I thought this was fantastic. I really appreciated the clarity and the level of um, quality that went into generating the images, particularly at the end. Mm -hmm. And it seems that it's very clear. You have a very clear method of teaching mm -hmm. uh, wire bending and oops, ah, perfect. teaching wire bending and uh, teaching how uh, the shapes and variations of designs come out. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, how do you characterize the cultural aspects, the cultural parts, right? If you're gonna make a grammar out of something, mm -hmm. you have to characterize it first and then you can quantify it mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. So how do you characterize culture? How do I characterize Enough culture? so that it can be computed. So I, I'm not computing culture. Um, I would say I am, um, um, the grammar has facilitated um, finding the important parts of, of these cultural practices, what is the culture of making in carnival, and facilitated new um, cultures, groups, roles, and relationships that can happen to further reinforce that culture of making together and doing things together. So, um, and what the research or research has afforded me to do is to unpack these histories and cultures that I could now share with you, right? So we are all computational designers, but I can share these histories and share these cultures with you that had, it, had I presented my work devoid of that, uh, a deep understanding of its importance might have been less so um, tied to the, the work and the process. So it, it's beyond the grammar and these computational things, but how it facilitates the sharing of these histories and knowledges. Right. But without, uh, just to be clear, without uh, characterizing the mm -hmm. grammatical, excuse me, the cultural part, mm -hmm. how do you know, because you had said at the end that uh, you didn't know what you were getting. Mm -hmm. You um, mean with the AI part? Yeah, mm -hmm. how do you control and control the outcome? I didn't want to control anything. This is just imagine, you know, exploratory, and the reality of it would be the next steps of attempting to make one of them. Um, but this was very much exploratory, just to see and be surprised by what might emerge. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so there you go. Lavender, do you want to? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. Oh, hi. I'm Lavender. I'm a PhD student in the computation group. And I'm Diego, also a PhD student at the computation group. Um, I can read this question. Um, the question is Do you think you might be headed towards a fully virtual carnival experience? maybe VR, um, and how might craft inform that? And how might a virtual immersive carnival change the physical carnival? Okay, I love that question because that will never happen. We need 
Um, like we need to see people, we need to touch people, we need we need each other physically, right? Um, I think what the virtual carnival does is it 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 moves it beyond the geo the geography and the specific location of where carnival happens, such that you all could experience it without actually going there if there's a pandemic or other things happening, right? So think of it as um, extending carnival, not replacing carnival, and giving other ways of engaging if one has other physical limitations, etc. but other ways of imagining carnival, showcasing carnival, experiencing carnival. So think of it as a supplement. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, another Actually, like two questions. Um, how quickly do students pick up and use the grammar? Mm -hmm. And the other one related to that, what was the process of creating the framework of situated computation? And will you add anything to it? OK. So how long did students take? So we did those three processes in four weeks, let's say five weeks. The first week, I just had them, and this was the students at Georgia Tech. So these were architecture students, not, not the um, art and art teachers and students I should prevent these. They were two groups, right? If we're talking about the Georgia Tech students, these were architecture students, um, five weeks in which they developed these skills that range from traditional to the technological, and then we were all able to build this pavilion, which took an entire semester, so five plus probably six weeks. Um, it was supposed to be a seminar, it ended up being something like a studio, which was a lot of work for students, but they were game. They were amazing. Um, when it came to the art students, that workshop was two days long. Um, two days or one day? No, one day long. Um, let's say eight hours, and that was really just testing and evaluating the grammar. Yeah. What was the second question again? The second is, uh, what oh, was the process of creating the framework of situated computation, and mm -hmm. will you add anything? Yeah, I think, I think things could be added to it. The process of it was really a reflection of the things that I've done thus far. Um, in addition to readings uh, coming out of STS, feminist theory on making things accessible. Um, so it really came from a reflection of all that I've done and I think my questions around who we have in our practice, in our field, and who we don't have, and who we need to make spaces for. Um, that was, I think, was a major driver behind the development of the framework. I have a question for you. Um, do you see like any connections from what you show with the Carnival AI mm -hmm. that is like basically like more visual? Mm -hmm. uh, and how will you, or are you thinking about like ways of like establishing like some bridges back to making, relating to like physical? Absolutely. So ideally, I would love to make some of these imaginary uh, dancing sculptures, right? That way, that, that comes into the generation of these cultural practices. We have these images and these possible designs, and we could invent histories, we could invent stories, and test the grammar, test wire bending at these scales again. So, um, yeah, it facilitates more people coming together to test and employ wire bending and explore it in making these structures and what making them a reality. Do you mean as a way of like decoding what is in the image through your Correct. grammar, for example? Absolutely, decoding. Well, I like you. I like you would decoding, but let's say making, attempting to make that a reality, and what the stories, the methods, the education or pedagogy, all that might go into trying to make that a reality. The innovations, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, it relates to a topic that showed up in your introduction and your conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that like some skills or types of knowledge um, kind of have more privilege yeah. in either in society or in a, gr a group of people. Um, I guess I'd like to hear what you think those are, like what types of skills get more privilege, mm -hmm. um, or what types of knowledge do. Um, and then, so that's like, I would love to hear more about that. And then I'd also like to hear like what the what you see the relationship being between kind of privilege and then like tacit knowledge or explicit knowledge. Great questions. Um, 
So, for example, in regions or cultures where um, we have these, you know, coding is everywhere in the U.S. now, right? Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, that might not be the main way of engaging in design or in communication, right? It might be through dance, it might be through art, through making. So the knowledges and the knowledge set of engaging might be kind of different, right? And so for me or anyone to come with a sort of very coding, abstract way of thinking and seeing the world in, in that setting is going to miss the mark. And that's not the goal of the work if I want to make computational design accessible, right? So how do I make computational design speaking the language of the setting, which is more embodied, it's fun, it's playful, it's celebratory, um, and it's a different way of thinking. I mean, I struggled with programming when I came to MIT. It, the language was just so different for me to take. I had to make it real to understand it. And so when it comes to that uh, privileging, we know when it comes to computation, robotics, all these things, it privileges a certain language that is coded, zeros and ones, and it's a language that that's, you know, it takes time for others. And so how do we make space, how do we as computational designers learn other languages that are spatial, embodied, corporeal, um, so that we can develop tools and come up with different ways of learning and making that employ knowledges of different sets? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's just that you said that um, carnival comes from like a sort of a place of release mm -hmm. um, and emotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose that you could say that the different crafts are a way of storytelling. Yeah. And so now that you like produce these new meaningless images with the AI, mm -hmm. are you trying to head towards another type of story? Like, are you trying to create new methods of storytelling, or are you trying to continue the earlier stories? New methods of storytelling. I, I like that you put it that way. We could, we could think of it as inventing a story through the artifact rather than the story creating the artifact. So I like your question because it it asks or it brings the possibilities of making stories to match a possible design. Um, but it's not, it's, not, it's not me, right? It's you know, seeing what other people will or might do. Um, so it's not from me. When I make, or if I try to like make one of them, then I can tell you the realities of that process and how um, the resulting artifact embodies a particular story that one might be trying to tell. Um, but I, I wouldn't say I'm deciding what it should be. It's, it's all playing with um, it as a voice, a voice of celebration, of storytelling, history, culture, all of those things. Yeah? Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It's such a joy to see the big picture of your work after having seen uh, bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not an architect, I'm not a designer, I'm an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And so my question for you is if you could um, speak a little bit about the ways that um, computational design or kind of this process that you've been engaging in around the, these making practices, um, what it does to or for attribution of, um, of the work and a sense, kind of the relationship of different publics to the work. So on one hand, you know, you showed the reactions to the AI mm -hmm. um, exhibit and folks being like, you know, you've done us proud and you're doing something for us now and in the future. So it mm -hmm. seems like there's a sense of um, ownership around it that's being put forward. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the grammars, um, make the craft, or, or at least some logics of the craft, available to a broader public. Yeah. 
And at the same time, the grammars are named after specific people. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also talking about Trinidad Carnival. So there's lots of different um, kind of entities that are um, connecting to the practice. And mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you think about what you're doing and how your research sort of um, redefines maybe the relationship of different groups mm -hmm. or different individuals to one another and to the practice. Nice. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I like that question. Um, so yes, I, I like the grammar is named after Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick because I studied them and Stephen Derrick learned from Albert Bailey. So it's, you know, we are honoring them. Um, and when it comes to the grammar opening up the work, um, I like that question because I'm able to, my response to that is always, it's not about the thing that is made. Whether my students in Georgia Tech or somewhere else at MIT, whether they make artifacts using the grammar, I'm happy about that. But it's about in the culture of carnival, these cultures, wherever they may be around the world, the fact that this craft may be dying, it means that these communities, these histories, these people getting together, that is not happening. So it's about what the grammar facilitates. In the context of Carnival and in Trinidad and Tobago, it facilitates people coming back together, making together, which currently we don't have much of as Carnival has become very commercialized, right? So it's about what the grammar facilitates, that being the social and cultural aspect of mentoring, communities coming together, cooperating, that social value is what it uh, gives to these communities. For, for another community, it might do something else. Yeah? OK. Just one more question is, um, have more traditional makers you spoke to in Trinidad uh, seen the computational work? Uh -huh. What do they think? Uh -huh. I will also add that also have people that is, are related to the carnival also have seen those images that you produce with the, that were produced by the algorithm. Mm -hmm. and what do they think? Okay, so the grammar part, yes, I took it uh, when I was finished developing it. So I think after my thesis, maybe, um, I uh, went back to Trinidad. I showed it to all the wirebenders who I gave them copies of it. And so I discussed it with them. And Albert Bailey, he said, he's like, yeah, I, I understand this. I know what this is. And um, Robert, his name escapes me right now, but Robert. Um, Robert said, ooh, this might help me. Yeah, this might help me because it's about tinkering and knowing what to do versus seeing it laid out in front of you. So they were appreciative of the practice. And again, I'm, I'm, Trinidad, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, but I was not of that culture of making in Carnival, so I needed entree for them to trust me and share all this with me, right? Um, when it comes to the AI-generated images um, and the project, let's say, feedback has been really supportive, really good. Um, and it's the first project I feel I've done that has touched the ground. Um, the other things I've done have been kind of in the bubble of academia. And this project like literally touched the ground in terms of people being able to engage and see these things. We had workshops. And so it, 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 uh, it means a lot, and reception has been good. Well, thank you so much. I, uh, I have to say it was really a beautiful talk and a lot of really beautiful images, and we can't wait to see what comes of this in, in, the, in the upcoming years. Thank you. So stay in touch. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you.